seated. Okay, good morning, members of the jury. Good morning. We're going to continue uh, this morning by turning to the defense and we'll call its next witness. Defense calls Parker Schenecker. <coughs> Your name again for the record? Parker Scheneker, S C H E N E C K E R. And, uh, and sir, I'm going to remind you, you were previously sworn in this proceeding. You're under oath. You may proceed. Yes, sir. Mr. Scheneker, um, <coughs> prior to meeting your ex wife, Julie Scheneker, what was, what were you doing for a living at that time? And I was in the United States Army. And at the time that you met Ms. Scheneker, um, how old were you then? I'm not, I met her in 88, so I was 26 or so. What was your position in the military at that time? I was a staff officer. Where were you stationed? I was stationed in Munich, Germany. Tell me how you ended up meeting Julie Schoenecker. Um, I had uh, been asked to join a volleyball program in the community uh, by, by a friend and uh, started with the team. Julie ended up being the coach of that team, did not know her at the time. Now was this a co-ed team? Yes, ma'am. Did Ms. Scheneker play as well as coach? I I'm not sure, Pro possibly. Okay. Was there a difference between the community team and a military team? Or was it the same? I believe it was one and the same, ma'am. Okay. When you first met Ms. Scheneker, how long before you started dating? I'm not sure, ma'am. Maybe, maybe within the first year. Okay. Where was she stationed at that time? In Munich as well, ma'am. When you first started dating, um, what attracted you to Julie Schenker? Uh, you know, just her, her athleticism, um, just her, her, you know, her ability to kind of stand up and, and take notice of things, take responsibility for things. What was her position at that time? Um, as far as coach. her job? Oh, as a uh, coach. She was a uh, uh, Russian, an interrogator. She okay. was debriefing folks. Was that something that she was doing in Munich? Yes, ma'am. As, as far as I know, I never, I never participated in that activity and, and never witnessed it. Okay. When you first began dating, were you long distance or were you stationed in the same location? For we were in the same general location, ma'am. Did that change at some point? When I was in Munich, no, ma'am. Okay. Did it at some point change where you were stationed somewhere else? Oh, yes, ma'am. How long were you dating at that time when you ended up being stationed somewhere else? Two, two years, maybe less than two years. Okay. When you were stationed somewhere else, where was the next station you had after Munich? The next duty station for me was Fort Huachuca, Arizona, H-U-A-C-H-U-C-A. -C -C now when you're, you're in the Army at that time? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and is Ms. Schenecker also in the Army or is she in a different branch? She's in the Army as well, ma'am. Okay. When you get stationed to another location, does that change what your job is at that time? <coughs> Usually it does. At that time, I, I went to be a student. So yes, I went from being a, be, to be a staff officer in Germany to being a student in Arizona. Okay, so when you were in Arizona, you were studying at that time in the military? Yes, ma'am. I started out as a student. Did you all continue your dating relationship at that point long distance? Yes, ma'am, we did. How long did that last that you all were a long distance couple between Arizona in Germany. Ma'am, I got there in maybe the fall of 90, if I remember correctly, it was right around the time Saddam invaded Kuwait. Um, 
and she arrived sometime maybe in yeah, late 91 or 92. The, it's, been a, it's been quite a while, ma'am. Okay. I don't remember the exact times. And when you first were in Arizona, did she, was she continuing at that time to be stationed in Munich? Yes, ma'am. She was still stationed in Munich. She still had time on her, her tour over there in Germany. Okay. You have a specified tour length once you go overseas. Now, when you end up being a, in a long distance relationship, how often are you seeing Julie at that time? Uh, ma'am, seeing her probably was not that often. Um, we spoke on the phone. This was days before internet, if anybody can believe that. Uh, we spoke on the phone, we wrote letters to each other, and from time to time we might have seen each other. If she came to the States for what's called a TDY or a temporary duty, uh, she came in for uh, volleyball tournaments. I believe she also came in for some training at Fort Huachuca as well, if, I, if my memory serves me right. Did you continue on with volleyball after being involved in that team in Germany? Yes, ma'am, I did, on my own. And the team that you were on in Munich that Ms. Schenecker was coaching, was that a team that traveled? Uh, we traveled in Germany, yes, ma'am. Okay. And was that the team that she was on when you said she was traveling for volleyball back to the States? No, ma'am. She played for the Army team. Okay. The, the whole, the big, you know, you know, the official U.S. Army team. Okay. At some point, do you all end up getting married? Yes, ma'am. Were, was there more than one ceremony? There was, ma'am. Okay. Tell me about the first ceremony. First ceremony was in June of 1991. It was in New Orleans. Uh, it was at a Justice of the Peace, uh, witnessed by my cousin Rufus Brown, R-U-F-U-S, deceased, and his wife Liz. So that was a small wedding? It was just the four of us, ma'am, just at the piece and uh, maybe maybe a clerk. Was your family aware of your wedding at that time or your marriage at that time? No, ma'am. Why not? Um, I had communicated or we had communicated at some point uh, with my family a desire to maybe do a justice of the peace service. Many, many, many military couples do that. And then to have the church recognize our wedding later on uh, d was not received very well from my family. Um, so I decided I just wasn't going to push the issue and and, uh, and openly disrespect them. Okay. Prior to your marriage, was did Julie end up being pregnant? That's what I was told, yes, ma'am. Okay. And what happened with that pregnancy? Uh, ma'am, that, that pregnancy was terminated. Were you part of that decision-making process? Yes, ma'am, I was. Okay. And did you go with Ms. Schenecker to that procedure? Yes, ma'am, I did. Where was that procedure done? Ma'am, I believe it was done in Tucson, Arizona. Okay. Was that when Ms. Schenecker was still stationed in Germany and going back and forth? Yes, ma'am. She was not permanently assigned to Arizona yet. Okay. What are the military benefits of having the Justice of the Peace ceremony and, and being married officially? So back when we were married, and I'm, I'm not sure if the program is still um, the way I'm, I'm going to explain it, but back when we got married, um, there was a program called the Married Army Couples Program. It was a formal program where married Army couples could register, and the Army would do their best to assign that couple either together on the same installation or as close as possible so they could continue on a family married life. Was that a benefit that you all wanted as a couple? I, I wanted it. I can't speak for Julie, but I believe so. Okay. After you were married, did you end up living together and being stationed in the same location? Yes, ma'am. Julie eventually got orders to Fort Huachuca as well. Okay. In Arizona? In Arizona, yes, ma'am. Is that the first time that you lived together? Yes, ma'am. Are there different options for living when you're in the military as far as whether you live on base or off base? Uh, sometimes you have an option, sometimes you don't. In depends, depends on the situation. Okay. In Arizona, what was your living situation as far as whether it was on base or off base? In Arizona, we were renting a, a house, at what we call out on the economy, in the, in the local town. Okay. So not something that's on the base? 
No, ma'am. We, we did not have children at the time. We would not have been authorized housing on base. Okay. So there are some times when you're not able to live on base if you don't have children? If they don't have availability, okay. right. They're, they're, the Army doesn't guarantee you a house. Prior to getting married or during the course of your relationship, do you at some time become aware that Ms. Scheniker had been sexually abused in the past? Uh, when we were dating, she mentioned that to me, ma'am. Is that and that's something that she told you what happened? Uh, she did say w which which did one? She, did she tell you what happened with the sexual abuse that she said? Sexual abuse, yes, ma'am. Okay. Prior to getting married, did you ever see any signs of depression or with Ms. Schenker? No, ma'am. We weren't together that much. When was the first time that you observed anything? Uh, we lived together in Arizona or were married in Arizona where we had day daily contact. What did you observe at that time? Um, I noticed that she had uh, some lower energy, uh, may not have been interested in doing some of the the physical activities that we had we had done together the first couple of years. What kind of physical activities did you all do as a couple? Well, we played volleyball, as you mentioned. Uh, we'd rollerblade, sometimes we'd walk. Is that, is mental illness or depression something that you're familiar with? Um, because of the last, you know, 23 years, yes ma'am, I had some experience with it. Prior to that, had you had any experience with either living with someone that has a mental illness, a friend or relative before? Not close, not close contact, ma'am. Do you have any military training regarding mental illness or suicide? Uh, a little bit on suicide, um, but every, every leader gets that in the Army. What kind of training do you get as a leader? It's a general suicide prevention program uh, just to try to keep folks, you know, keep in contact with your troops, make sure you know about their family histories, make sure that they're supported, you know, when a unit, you know, unit may move. Um, but that's about it. Just really just kind of general health of the force. At some point, does Ms. Schenker make the decision to leave the military? Yes, ma'am. When was that? Ma'am, I believe that was 1993. Where were you all located at that time when she ended her career there? So I was in Germany. She was in Arizona. Okay. When you were in Arizona living together as a married, a young married couple, where do you end up going after Arizona? Ma'am, I got restationed to Germany. What town was that? Vilsack, V-I-L-S-E-C-K. Now, when you're in the military and you move, is there assistance for moving? Yes, ma'am. I mean, they come and pack up your house. You don't have to touch anything. They come pack up your house and then unpack it on the other side if you choose to. There's reservations made on planes and you're transported and so forth. Yes, ma'am. Who sets up housing for the next location that you're going to? Who actually sets up the ability to have a house or actually sets up the house itself? What are you asking? Both. Um, the Army takes care of, well, it's the service member that has to do the official uh, work to get the, the billeting or the housing at the next place. And it's up to the family as to who, you know, actually literally sets up the home. Okay. When you end up going to Germany, uh, to Vilsack, what kind of location are you living at that time? I lived in, uh, in an apartment. So in Germany, a lot of the families will have multi-floor dwellings, multi-floor houses, and they may rent out a top floor on their house. We were living in the top floor on, uh, of someone's house. Okay. Off on the economy, not on base. Did you talk to Julie about her decision to leave the Army or to end her tour? Yes, ma'am. She, uh, she was pretty open about her desire to, to finish up. She wanted to finish uh, just before she had 10 years in service uh, to give her the opportunity to come back in the service as a commissioned officer. At that time, that's what the rule was. 
Do you, did she express to you any desire to have children? Yes, sir. I mean, yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we both we both uh, expressed desire to have children. And was that a discussion that you had when you were dating as well as when you were married? Yes, ma'am. When did you all end up having a child? Uh, Calix was born the 12th of September, 1994. Where was that? That was in Sulzbach, Rosenberg, Germany, S-U-L-Z-B-A-C-H dash R-O-S-E-N-B-E-R-G, Germany. Where were you stationed at the time that she was born in 1994? In Vilsack, V-I-L-S-E-C-K. Okay, so in the same location that you went to after Arizona? Yes, ma'am. It was a German hospital. How was uh, Julie as a first-time mother? Um, I thought she was a good first-time mother. I, I didn't have any, any comparisons to make, but I thought she was a good mother. When you, um, when Calix was born, were you there for her birth? Yes, ma'am, I was. Were other family members there as well? Uh, for, the, for the birth itself in the room? No, ma'am, I think it was just me. Uh, my mother was in Germany with us at that time. I think my father came shortly afterwards. When you were stationed in Germany, were there times when family members would come to visit? Yes, ma'am. Did anyone live with you permanently at that time? No, ma'am. Were you traveling during that time as part of your duties in Vilsack? Time in Vilsack, I was not traveling very much. I might be in the, we did a lot of field maneuvers, so we're in the field training quite a bit. The longest period of time that I might have been away might have been 57 days. Now, when, after Calix was born, did you all have any type of nanny or assistance at the home? Not in Vilsack, no, ma'am. Was Calix in any kind of daycare, or did, did Ms. Schenecker primarily care for her? Julie was the primary caregiver. Where did you all go after Vilsack? We were restationed in Würzburg, W-U-R-Z-B-U-R-G, Germany. How long were you in Vilsack before you went to Würzburg? Approximately two years. Okay. And when you went to Würzburg, how long were you all there? One year, ma'am. And during that time in Würzburg, did did Ms. Schenecker continue to be a primary caretaker for Calix, or was anyone else involved in caring for Calix? She the was the primary caregiver. I believe we, we had a nanny at that time as well, okay. but Julie was the primary caregiver. When you were going to Vilsack and, and Würzburg after Ms. Schenecker left the military, was she working at that time? Uh, no, ma'am, she wasn't employed. She was self-employed. She was doing some crafting and making some, uh, if this was the right time, I'm not sure exactly when that started, <laughs> making some um, baby gifts and, and some things like that. Okay. And kind of hit the, hit the craft circuit that happens in military families who are stationed overseas. And that was something that, that Ms. Schenecker was doing, is making crafts or selling baby items? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did that end up being some type of full-fledged business, or was it just like a, a side hobby? It ended up being a, a business that she actually was a concessionaire once we were eventually in Kansas. Okay. Where do you go after Würzburg? We went to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And when you were in Würzburg, how long were you there? A year, ma'am. What was your position in Kansas? A student, ma'am. Okay. As you're going through your different tours, are you moving up in the ranks at this time? Ma'am, pretty much everyone moves up in the ranks as long as you're, you have faithful service. You're looked at at a prescribed time in your, in your career. You're evaluated for your ability for the next rank, and you're either selected or not for promotion. 
Is every move a promotion? No, ma'am. Okay, so some moves are not promotions and some are. In my case, most of the moves were not promotions. <laughs> were not promotions? Were not promotions. Okay. When you went to Kansas, what were you studying there at that time? Military science, ma'am. How long were you in Kansas? It was a year's tour, ma'am. Now, during your time in Germany and then leading up to Kansas, were there any family members that lived with you all during those times? <coughs> Full time? No, ma'am. Okay. People visiting? Yes, ma'am. And I believe your testimony was that as you went along in Kansas, was Ms. Schenecker continuing to do the crafting? Yes, ma'am. Kansas is where she... Uh, she eventually ended up being a concessionaire up at the exchange, so she had a booth that was hers, a little bit more of a business, I guess you could call it. Now, as far as financially supporting the family, who was doing that? That was me, ma'am. Okay. The money that she was making from this business, was it something that was contributing to paying household bills and things of that nature? Um, it, it could have, but I let Julie you know, keep the money that she made for whatever she wanted to, she wanted to use it for. Okay. It was not critical to us paying our bills. Okay. Where did you all go after your year in Kansas? We went to Hawaii, ma'am. How long were you stationed in Hawaii? Almost three years. Now, when you were in Hawaii, did anyone come and live with you during that time? Uh, no one ever lived with us. Um, but I think what you're, what you're getting at is my mother at that time um, packed up her home in Texas and after my father passed away in 98 um, and she moved out to Hawaii into a condominium that was about 20 minutes away to be closer to the kids. When did your mother move to Hawaii? Ma'am, I don't, I, I, it was within the last nine months of our tour. I left in February of 2000, so whatever that is. And you said she lived in a condominium? Yes, ma'am. How far away was that from where you all were residing? About 20 minutes, ma'am. Okay. And I'm sorry if you already said sorry, that. Sorry, ma'am. Did How often would you see your mother at that time? Um, I saw her usually on the weekends uh, because she wasn't around in the evenings really usually. Um, I imagine she was available any time that we wanted her, any time the kids wanted to see her. But I would say maybe a couple of times a week she'd, she'd ask to come over to the house and just be available. How old was Calix at that time? She was born in September 94. This was between 97 and 2000, so anywhere from three to five to six. Okay. And was Bo born in Hawaii? Yes, ma'am, he was. When your mom moved to Hawaii, was that before or after Bo's birth? It was after. Okay. He was born 29 September 1997, a few months after we got there. Okay, so Bo was born shortly after you all moved to Hawaii. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so Julie Schenecker would have been pregnant when you all were in Kansas when you were a student. Yes, ma'am. Okay. When you all... Um, when Bo was born, were family members around for his birth? My mom was in for that time. Okay. And for his actual birth, were you present for his birth? Regrettably, I was not, ma'am. Where were you at that time? Ma'am, I was on another island. Was that for work? No, ma'am. What were you doing on the other island when Bo was born? Ma'am, I, I was on a, a long weekend uh, hiking. Bo was, Bo was about two and a half to three weeks early. Did um, Ms. Schenecker's family ever come for the children's births? Not that I can recall, ma'am. Were they there afterwards? It's possible, ma'am, but I, I don't recall. Okay. When you were there in Hawaii um, for three years, what was your position? Were you still a student then? No, ma'am. I was a staff officer again. Okay. And after you left Hawaii, where did you all go? We went to Virginia, Alexandria, Virginia. Okay. 
when you went to Virginia, um, how old were the children at that time? So that was 2000. So Calix was approximately six. Bo was approximately three. Did Calix start school in Hawaii? She was in a preschool in Wahiwa, W-A-H-I-A-W-A. -A -A. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Bo was not. He was at home. Now, when you all were in um, Hawaii, is Julie Shenifer, is she still the primary caregiver for the children at that time? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you are um, stationed or moved to Virginia, does Ms. Shenneker go with you automatically? Which Ms. Shenneker? <laughs> not your mother, your, okay, your ex-wife. Uh, she does not. She stayed, in, she stayed in Hawaii for a while. Okay. How long from the time that you ended up going to Virginia, what was the lag between when you went to Virginia and Julie Shenneker arrived? I mean, my recollection, I, I went in February, and I believe Julie and the kids came in April, okay. so a couple of months. What was the reason for the lag? Um, she communicated to me that she just wasn't going. Okay. She and the kids weren't going. And did you end up speaking to her and convincing her to come to Virginia at that time? I, I, she eventually came. Okay. Did you communicate with her oh, during yes, that time frame? Absolutely. Okay. When Ms. Schenneker was um, in Hawaii and Kansas and Germany. You're saying that the first time that you saw any kind of low energy from Ms. Schenneker was shortly after you got married in Arizona and you're living together. It was before we got married, but... Okay. But no, I'm sorry. It was... Yeah, it could have been when we were living together. Okay. Right? Does that continue, the low energy? Uh, on and off, ma'am. It's kind of like a drumbeat, as I mentioned in my previous deposition, a drumbeat across our 20-year relationship. Now, what does that mean to you, a drumbeat? Can you explain that to the jury? Sure. It's just that it's just uh, kind of expected in the scenes. She would have periods of higher energy, uh, what we would kind of consider our normal activity, and then she would have periods where she had lower energy, where she might not have wanted to play ball or might have spent some time in bed, as I mentioned before. Um, so that's what I mean by drumbeat. Did she, did you discuss with her at all her energy level, her depression, or her bipolar? You know, from time to time across the 20 years, yes, ma'am, we did. Okay. Were you active in her medical treatment? No, ma'am. Okay. Were you aware of any kind of medications that she was taking? Yes, ma'am, I knew she was taking some meds, uh, but I did not monitor them, you know, ever looking at the prescription bottles and, and you know, monitoring her intake. No, ma'am. When, um, when you all go to Virginia, how long are you there? February 2000 to June of 2002. Okay. And you mentioned the other Miss Shenneker, your mother, Nancy Shenneker. Did yes, she end up going to Virginia as well? Yes, ma'am. She rocked. She came with us. Where did she live in relation to where you all were living at that time? Seven or eight doors up a townhouse complex so literally up the same sidewalk um, that we lived the kids could roll right up to her right up to her house which was awesome now are you living you're not living in military housing at that time we are not ma'am okay and what was the term you call it i don't know for living in All a right. and she went to nimh is that a discussion that you all had as a couple so um, Julie came to me and said, um, I found this program that I'd really like to participate in. Um, it was a clinical study for alternative treatments to depression, I believe. Um, it was, it was uh, called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or RTMS. And what's that? Um, I, you should ask the docs yesterday. But really what it is is it's, it's magnetic uh, impulses that are put into the brain that may or may not help with, uh, I guess, episodes or symptoms of depression. Did you go to some of those treatments? I, I sat in one of the treatments, yes, ma'am. What did you observe? Um, sat in a chair, almost like a dentist chair, and a head harness was put on her, and um, it was just really loud. I know that I had headphones on, and I saw what I saw what they were doing, and then I ended up walking out.
and waiting for the treatment to be done. It was upsetting to you to watch that? Oh, no, ma'am. It was just loud. It was just really loud. And it was okay. just, there, there, you couldn't talk, you couldn't converse. It was pretty loud. The treatment at NIMH, how long was your wife there at that time? I don't remember it being as long as I've heard in some testimony now, but I guess the testimony earlier was she was in there for about nine months. She went in for the clinical, clinical trial. Um, they, they did a PET scan and then baseline, took her off all her meds, did another baseline PET scan to see kind of what her brain physiology, I guess, was, then did the series of treatments and then did, did another PET scan at the end to see if there had been any benefit in her case. I'm sure for their clinical trials, they needed to have some, some proof one way or the other. And then, they, and then their responsibility was to get her back on the right meds to get her back into the family. And did she leave there with medication? I, yes, ma'am, I believe so. Okay. And is that something that you followed up with after she left the hospital? Is it something I followed up with? Yes. The meds or the treatment or? The, the meds or the treatment. I don't know that I followed up with anything. I'm not sure that I had a responsibility to follow up with anything. Okay. So you didn't think that that was your responsibility? That was her responsibility? Uh, it was her, her illness. It was her responsibility to follow up with her doctor's appointments. Yes, ma'am. Okay. When, when Julie Schoenecker was in the hospital, who was caring for the children? So I was the primary caregiver. Uh, we did bring a nanny in at that point. Uh, now, was that a live-in nanny? We brought a live-in nanny in at that point because we had a feeling that at some point the doctor would have said, this is how long the, the trial lasts. And so I would have brought in a nanny because it, it wasn't my mom's responsibility to take care of the kids either. And your mom was still down the street? Yes, ma'am. She was living the same place. Okay. And when the children, um, I'm sorry, when you say the doctor would say how long the treatment would be, did the length of treatment vary between the individuals? I'm not sure, ma'am. Okay. I don't, that wasn't communicated to me. All right. Did you speak to the doctors and were you aware of the treatment that she was undergoing when she was at that hospital? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was allowed to be involved. I was allowed to know what was going on. After Julie Schoenecker got out of the hospital, were you all still continued to be um, stationed there in Virginia? For a while, ma'am. I'm not sure exactly when she got out of, of that, uh, that trial okay. and when we left. Now, when, you, when she went into the hospital, were you in school at that time? No, ma'am. I was, uh, I was making, doing assignments for officers. Okay. Did you delay any schooling in order for her to go to NIMH and participate oh, in that? Okay, ma'am. I, I, I had started my master's degree, um, and I had, to, I had to delay that based on everything that was going on. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Were you aware of the diagnosis at the end of her time at NIMH of bipolar disorder? I believe Dr. Spear mentioned that to me, yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, when you're aware of that, are you doing any research on your own as far as what your wife's illness is? Um, from time to time I did um, at that time, and it, maybe it was before she went into uh, she went into NIMH, but I had had a lot of contact with Dr. Spear at that time. Um, I was free to ask him any question that came up, and he was free to answer any question that I asked. Um, so I understood at least at that time what was going on with her while she was at NIMH, because I was there three or four days a week. When Ms. Schoenecker got out of the hospital, was she able to engage back in with your family? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And did she resume the responsibilities that she had before? Did you all keep the nanny at that time? The nanny wasn't there much longer, if, if at any. No, she didn't stay around. Okay. 
And was Ms. Schoenecker able to resume taking care of the household and the children at that time? Yes, ma'am. I mean, and, and the, as part of the drumbeat, I always had to jump in and, and fill the gaps when there were gaps. Okay. So that was my responsibility. And would your mom also help out with that from time to time? Sure, but primarily it was my responsibility. It was our relationship, not my mom's. Okay. Where did you all go after Virginia? We went to Ansbach, A-N-S-B-A-C-H, Germany. When you were there in Ansbach, what was your position? I was the community commander. And were you living on base at that time, or were you living in we, the... We were living on base in the designated home Okay. for the commander. Now, when your wife leaves NIMH and she has these medications and this treatment, does the military provide for helping deal with different family members' medical situations? Yes, ma'am. As I had mentioned to you previously, there's a program in the Army called the Exceptional Family Member Program. And every time uh, an Army family moves, whether it's overseas or not, uh, anyone that has any sort of exceptional circumstance, it could be actually a gifted student, it could be someone with a, a medical issue that needs to be accommodated, a learning disability, any sort of uh, harder handicap like American Disabilities uh, Act sort of things, um, any sort of exceptional circumstances in that Army family's life is review formally reviewed by some process. Uh, to see whether or not the gaining location can accept that family for treatment, accommodation, what, whatever that exceptional circumstance is. Now, as, as far as the military being aware of Julie Schenecker's illness and her treatment, is that something that began the minute you all got married? Do you qualify for that? For the exceptional family member program? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Any, anyone okay. who is in the Army who is being reviewed for a new assignment goes to, they're, they're, if they're enrolled in the exceptional family member program, then they, they, get that, uh, they get that review. Okay, so you have to affirmatively enroll in that program. Um, you, you know, ma'am, I'm not really sure how that worked. It's, it, it, I, just know, I just know the process that works after the fact. Do you remember at some point your family not being enrolled in the program and then being enrolled? No, ma'am. We, like I said, mentioned the Married Army, Army Couples Program. We had to enroll for that. I don't remember us formally doing any sort of enrollment for the EFMP program, but w there was paperwork you had to fill out every time you were moving. So I, that's probably what I figured was the enrollment. Now, when you go to Ansbach, how long are you there at that time? Two years, ma'am. And is Ms. Schenecker continuing to have times of low energy, times of having better energy during that time in Germany? Is that a constant? Yes, ma'am. Okay, even after the hospitalization? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Where did you go after your two years in Ansbach? We went to Heidelberg, H-E-I-D-E-L-B-E-R-G, Germany. Now, during these times in Virginia, in Germany, when you're going back after she gets out of the hospital, is she working at all or doing crafting? Uh, in Virginia, she actually had a um, she actually applied for and, and took a, a a job that was more than just crafting and and and, and uh, kind of working out of the home. She took a job down in an art gallery in Old Town, Alexandria. How long did that last? Ma'am, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I really don't remember. When Ms. Schenecker was in Germany, did she continue to work there? No, ma'am. Still did some of the cra still had some of the crafting items around. Maybe she was sewing at that time as well. <coughs> but that would have been what she was focused on, on from a from a job perspective, if you will. Now, she also she also coached. Uh, she also coached the community volleyball team okay. in Germany, in uh, Würzburg. Were those adults or kids? They were adults. Okay. When your mother had lived down nearby in Hawaii and then nearby in Virginia, does she continue and move with you all when you go to Germany? No, ma'am. Okay. 
when you're in Germany, are there any family members living nearby? No, ma'am. Your time in Ansbach, were you traveling a lot during that time frame? No, ma'am. If I was traveling, it was a it was a, a day trip, maybe a trip to the States for a conference for a couple of days, but not, not a lot of travel. When you leave Ansbach, you go to Heidelberg? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And how long are you all in Heidelberg? One year, ma'am. When you're in Heidelberg during that time, what is your position? I was a staff officer. And are you traveling during that time? Back into the field again for training maneuvers. Uh, longest period of time might have been two to three weeks in the field. Now, is traveling a constant for you as a military family? Traveling is constant for us, as a, especially for us as a military family. We all traveled. We traveled together for official travel. We traveled together for fun and personal travel. And Julie and I traveled together as a couple for fun. And we each traveled individually as well. And then were there times also on top of that that you're traveling for whatever position you're at? And I traveled for official duty myself. Yes, ma'am. OK. So it's not unusual for you to take trips, either together together as a couple or separate? No, ma'am, that's, that's, that was one thing that our family did a lot of, and we enjoyed it. OK. Would you be able to ever put a number on how many times you traveled either by yourself for work or by yourself for trips that you were taking with friends or going to visit family? Over the course of our 20-year marriage? Yes. Oh, no, ma'am. OK. I, I, could, I likewise couldn't count that number for Julie either. OK. From Heidelberg, where do you go after your year there? We went to um, Maryland. Okay. And how long are you in Maryland? One year, ma'am. What, what's your position there in Maryland? A staff officer, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> and at that time, is Julie working at all? No, ma'am. Okay. No. She's taking care of the kids in the yes, home? Yes, ma'am. Primary caregiver. Are you traveling a lot during that time in Maryland? No, ma'am, not much. Were the hours when you were back in Germany and in Heidelberg and Ansbach, were your hours long during those time frames? No, ma'am, really more sort of office hours, if you will, unless we were in the field. That was a 24-7 sort of thing. I was preparing the unit to go to Iraq. Um, as the commander in Ansbach, there may be some evening events. Uh, that I had to go to either meetings with the mayor or the governors, um, some social engagements that I had to, I had to do because I was the senior United States rep in the in the community. Were there times that Ms. Schenecker was involved with going to you, you know, as a, as a military wife for engagements that you had for your position? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And were there times when you were working that you worked longer hours, like 20-hour days? Yes, ma'am. When was that? And that was the year in Würzburg. Okay. In Würzburg. And was that after Calix was born? It was after Calix was born, yes, ma'am. And before Bo was born? Yes, ma'am. When you were working those long hours, those 20-hour uh, days, was anyone there with Ms. Schenecker to help out with the kids? No one was brought into the home to, to help out. Julie did have a really good support group. She had met some, uh, some other first-time mothers through the La Leche League program. Um, so she had a, a tight group of two or three or four gals with their kids, and they, they got together a lot and supported each other. Now, was that a, when you're saying La Leche, is that a, like a breastfeeding type club? It's a breastfeeding support group, I believe. Okay. Did Julie breastfeed the children? Yes, ma'am, she did. When the children were in a position where they had to make doctor's appointments, things like that, were you involved with that? Uh, Julie was the primary uh, mover for that because I was usually at work. When Julie was pregnant with your children, did you go to the doctor's appointments? Excuse me, we have to
when your wife, Julie Schoeniker, um, was pregnant with your children, Bo and Calix, were you involved with going to doctor's appointments and things like that? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. Where did you all go after Maryland? Pennsylvania. Okay. When you went to Pennsylvania, what were you doing there at that time? What was your duty? I was a student, ma'am. How long were you there in Pennsylvania? A year, ma'am. And was that a move that was a promotion? No, ma'am. Okay. When you left from Pennsylvania, where did you all go? We came to Tampa, July 2007. And was that, Tampa was the last place that you were stationed? Eventually, yes, ma'am. When did you all move to Tampa? July 2007, ma'am. July 9th, 2007. Were there periods throughout your marriage prior to moving to Tampa where you and your wife, Julie Schoeniker at that time, that you all were involved with marriage counseling? Yes, ma'am. When did that happen? Ma'am, it was various times across, the, across our relationship in the years. Um, we would go to counseling when we were having some challenges, I think like most people do. We actually went to counseling when things were, were going pretty well as well. Uh, just to maintain what we were doing. Um, the only time I actively remember us in counseling before Tampa was Maryland, but that doesn't mean we weren't going to counseling in some other locations. Okay. And was that something that you both participated in? Marital counseling, yes, yes. ma'am. Yes, okay. When you all moved to Tampa, were you living on base or were you living in a residential neighborhood? We, re we le rented a home in New Tampa. Okay. The home that you lived in in Tampa Palms, was that the first home that you lived in in Tampa? No, ma'am. Okay. How long did you rent a home prior to purchasing the home in New Tampa? Approximately a year. When you all lived here, was Ms. Schoeniker working at all during that time frame? She did, ma'am. She had a job at a, a cafe that had just opened up relatively close to, the, to her house. Do you um, remember how long that job lasted? I want to say it was maybe less than a year. Was working something that Julie was interested in doing? Uh, she seemed to like that job. She liked the people with whom she was working. Um, so, okay. yes, ma'am. How old are the kids when you move here to Tampa? So 2007, Calix would have been 12 or 13. Bo would have been 10, 9 or 10. What is your traveling situation when you're here in Tampa, your position here? So the position here as a staff officer um, t took me to the Middle East quite often. How often was that that you're traveling? About every six weeks I was traveling either to the Middle East, I could have been traveling to Germany, to Texas, uh, to Maryland, uh, other places here in the U.S. About every six weeks or so I was, I was traveling somewhere. And when you're traveling every six weeks, what are the time frames? So as quickly as a day trip, for instance, maybe to one of the spots here in the U.S., um, as short as a four-day trip to the Middle East. I mean, I've been to the Middle East for a 24-hour conference before and come back, you know, 80 hours of flying for 24 hours on the ground. The longest time that I was away from the home in Tampa was seven months, okay. and that was a, a f formal long-term deployment from uh, fall of 2008 to February 2009. I'm sorry, what was fall the Fall of 2008 to February 2009. During that time frame, that seventh month time period in 2008 leading to 2009, when you were gone for seven months, did anyone come in to assist? I don't remember bringing anyone in f for the whole time. Okay. But I'm sure, I'm, sure there, I'm sure at least my mom would come from time to time to make sure everything was okay and just checking in and seeing the kids. Okay. Your mom was a frequent visitor to the home? Yes, ma'am. A welcomed visitor. 
when um, when the children are growing up, what is Julie Schoenacher's relationship to the kids, to Calix and Bo? What's her relationship to the kids? What is, what's her relationship like leading up to this time frame when you come to Tampa? Are they close? Um, immediately before Tampa, or you, you kind of left that open for along the whole time continuum, so. Immediately coming to Tampa. Uh, relationship was, was fine. We were, you know, doing another move. We were coming to, uh, we were coming to a place with uh, warmer weather by the water certainly made Julie really happy. Um, you know, was able to f kind of get that, get that fun car to, to give her and, and have some fun down in Florida. I think the kids were, uh, the kids were looking forward to some for, uh, warmer weather after being in Pennsylvania for a year. Um, so I think it was, uh, it was kind of an uplifting visit for us or a move for us. When you all moved here, was there an intention or a conversation about you ending your military career here in Tampa? Eventually, ma'am, and I don't remember the time frame. Um, Julie and I had a discussion about when the right time was to go out. And uh, I knew I was here for a three-year tour, so normally we would have departed in the summer of 2010 and moved somewhere else. I was able to ask for and got a, a one-year extension to be here. So that would have been 2011. And I knew that the Army was not going to give me another extension after that. It's just, it's highly unlikely. And I was just, I was not willing to move the kids again, going into high school, PSATs, SATs, college visits, all that sort of stuff. So we talked about it and made the decision where we're going to retire here. Okay. And by retire, meaning you're just going to end your military career and start a, a different career? It department. wasn't decided at that point, but I wasn't ready to just kick my feet up. Yes, ma'am. Okay. During the time frame that you're here, um, does your mother ever come and live permanently down here in Tampa when you're here? No, ma'am. Okay. So the last time your mother lives nearby is when you're in Virginia? Yes, ma'am, Virginia. Okay. And your mother ended up putting down roots in Louisiana? Louisiana and Texas. She, okay. she lives more in Texas than she does in Louisiana sometimes. When you're moving from location to location, is Ms. Schenecker, Julie Schenecker, getting going to doctors, seeking treatment, things like that? Yes, ma'am. And so, for instance, uh, I'll give you an example. When we went to Ansbach, um, there was some question as to whether or not the facilities in Germany would be able to handle uh, Julie, having just come out of RTMS, um, the trial. And so I worked with Dr. Speer, her treating physician at NIMH, and found a doctor in Germany who was actually performing the procedure because it was legal, it was legal in Germany. It was not yet legal in the U.S. So I worked with Dr. Speer and all the docs in Landstuhl, L-A-N-D-S-T-U-H-L. Didn't know it was going to be a spelling test this morning. Um, I, I worked to get um, her care. Um, on the German economy with the German docs, you know, to take care of the RTMS, which seemed to have, have helped her some. So yeah, I was, I was active in, in making sure that she had what she needed on that, on that trip. Okay. Are you keeping up with her medication or her appointments or anything of that nature? Oh, ma'am, I wasn't monitoring the, the medication she was on. I wasn't monitoring her, uh, her appointments. There were appointments not only for, you know, to see her, her, uh, mental health professionals, but also the docs. There were a lot of appointments, Calix's and Bo's and hers, and so I wasn't monitoring that. But. Did your wife at the time, did she also have medical issues like physical injuries? Wh which time, ma'am? Just in general? Yes, in general. Uh, yes, ma'am. There, there were some physical things she went and got taken care of. And what were those? What surgeries did she have? Um, over the course of our um, of our life together. She'd had a couple of surgeries. Um, I believe she had a shoulder surgery, um, a knee surgery or two, um, and then she had had some elective plastic surgery as well. Was, were the knee and shoulder surgeries something that you were aware of, injuries from volleyball or? I think the shoulder surgery was a skiing 
injury and the knee surgeries were from either volleyball and she picked up tennis when we were here in Tampa and I think she had her knee again. Did she ever have to have like a total knee replacement? No, ma'am. Okay. They were all meniscectomies, just taking out pieces of the meniscus. Now, did you also have surgeries as well? Yes, ma'am. When the children moved to Tampa, I believe you said Calix was 12? 12 or, she was born in September 94. We okay. got here July 2007, so. She would have been in middle school at the time when you all moved here? I believe so, ma'am. And Bo would have been in elementary school? I believe so, yes, ma'am. Now, were they enrolled in feeder schools or community schools when you rented the home? They were enrolled in the public schools we were zoned for. I think okay. that's what you're getting at. And when you moved to the home in New Tampa, did that change what schools they were zoned for at that yes, time? Yes, ma'am. And what happened with Calix as far as her middle school? So Calix had been at Benito, B-E-N-I-T-O -E middle, and she desired to stay at Benito for her eighth grade year, even though uh, she was zoned for a different school. And was that something that you all did for her? It's something we discussed and we supported, yes, ma'am. Okay. How did Bo get to school when he, when you all moved here? The, he would take the bus. Okay. Was that always in elementary school as well as in middle school? Yes, ma'am. And what about Calix? How did she get to school? Calix walked to school the first year at Benito, and then because we had moved a couple of miles down the road, uh, Julie drove her to and from school to Benito uh, her eighth grade year. Okay. There was no bus that got her back over there. All right, so she couldn't do a bus because you're outside of the zone, so. School of choice, so you have to drive okay. yourself. Were the kids active in activities, sports, extracurricular activities? Bo was playing soccer and flag football. Calix was running. Were probably her extra extra extracurricular activity. And who's getting the kids back and forth from their activities? Mostly, that would be Julie. Were you also were you attending games, things like that, when you could? Yes, ma'am. And did Miss Shunnaker also do that? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Was Calix an artist as well? Yes, ma'am. And is that something that? Ms. Schenecker encouraged in her? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Was that something that they shared since Ms. Schenecker was doing crafts and was a little bit artsy and, and Calix was also an arts? Uh, yes, ma'am. They would sit and, and work on some projects or Julie would give ideas. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Was Julie an, was Ms. Schenecker an avid reader? Um, I didn't see her reading every night. It, there, there were not, I didn't see turnover of books all the time. So no, I wouldn't say she was an avid reader, no ma'am. When you all moved to the home in Tampa Palms, was there an area where Julie would smoke? Yes ma'am. Okay. Smoking, is that something that she did for the course of your relationship? Entire time I've known her, yes ma'am. Okay. There's been a lot of talk about, since you've been present for the testimony, about drinking. Yes, ma'am. Talk to me about how you all as a couple um, drank socially or didn't drink during the course of your relationship. I mean, I, I think in my deposition earlier, I had communicated to you that we were social drinkers, uh, you know, a couple of drinks a week or so, maybe a, you know, a drink with, with a meal here or there. Um, certainly was not the focus of our life. Was there ever a time prior to 2010 where you believed that drinking was any type of problem for Julie Schenecker? Uh, Ma'am, there, there was a time back in Ansbach when uh, it was probably January of 2004 or so. We were in an event, and uh, a formal event, a big New Year's reception that, that we were hosting, and, uh, and Julie had a little too much. But that wasn't a that wasn't a uh, 
she had a lot too much, but it, that wasn't something that was constant over that from that time till now. That was an isolated event that you were. Uh, that in my mind, it was an isolated event. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And did you ever take any measures in the home to remove alcohol from the home? Uh, no, ma'am. I, I did not. Okay. Your, um, your parents, I believe you indicated to Dr. Obergon that your father had issues with alcohol? Yes, ma'am. Okay. When, unlike mental health issues, alcoholism would be something that you'd be familiar with based on your family history? Uh, yes, ma'am. When did the relationship between Calix and your ex-wife, Julie Schenecker, when did that start to deteriorate? You mean, I, I really can't put my finger on it or, or any sort of event, you know, gener generating event. I'm going to say it was maybe about the time she was finishing up middle school, starting high school. When when your daughter Calix, when she ended up going to the IB program, tell me how that process came to be that she went to the IB program. Ma'am, she came to uh, to me one night and said, I really want to do this international baccalaureate program at King. Um, it's a, you know, it's a highly competitive program and I want to get into a really good college. So I'd really like to do that. We talked about it, Julie and Calix and I talked about it, about the logistical requirements of getting her there and getting her home and and uh, that it was a little bit off. You know, we had just moved to get her in an A-rated school, and now she wanted to go a di to a different school. Uh, but we worked through that very quickly. It was what uh, it was the right thing for for Calix uh, to meet her her needs, her desires, and to and to let her get an opportunity to get into a top tier school. Now, was Calix someone that was always driven academically? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And was that something that you all had to stay on top of her about doing her homework or studying for a test, things like that? No, ma'am, not at all. Did you keep up at all with the children's grades? Uh, from time to time, yes, ma'am. Okay. Especially if there was an issue. Uh, Julie might have brought an issue up to me, and then we'd address it at that time. <laughs> during, during the course of your time here in Tampa, would Ms. Schenecker monitor the grades and also keep you informed of that? Yes, ma'am, she did. Okay. Did she keep you up to date on the activities that maybe you were at work for and that she was involved with with the children? Um, yes, but I mean, I kept up with those as well. If I was, for instance, if I was on a trip, um, I had email connectivity with the, with the kids and Bo may tell me how a soccer game turned out or something like that. So. Okay. So as the children got older, you can have your own communication with them when you're traveling as well as with your wife at sure. that time? Sure, sure. Who was getting, who was responsible at that time when you moved to Tampa Palms and Calix is involved in King? How was she getting back and forth to school? And she was part of a carpool, a neighborhood carpool. And how was Bo getting back and forth to middle school at that time? Yes, ma'am. He was going to Liberty Middle School on the bus to and from every day. Were you involved from time to time with the carpool? Yes, ma'am, usually in the afternoons. Okay. I would pick up the kids. Sometimes Calix was separated from the kids because she was doing, uh, she was on the athletics teams. So I'd go pick up carpool, take those kids home, drive back to school, pick up Calix and drive her home. Okay, so multiple pickups based yes, on the kids after school activities? Yes, ma'am. And was Ms. Schenecker someone who attended Calix's track or cross-country meets? Yes, ma'am. And did she attend both soccer games? Yes, ma'am. Sometimes we had to split up because they were at the same time, so we'd kind of flip a coin and see who went to which one. Okay. As far as communicating with your family when you were out of town traveling, how did you do that? Um, if I was here in the States, it was easy because I had my, you know, I had my cell phone with me that I could use readily. Um, so I would keep in touch either through cell phone calls or emails or texts. Um, if I was overseas, that was a little bit more, a lot more problematic. Um, I would communicate through emails as much as I could because that was easier to type something out than it was sometimes to get a phone call in. 
I had emails, I had uh, phone calls, and I had uh, video chat capability from time to time as well. Were there times when you were in the country and, and not traveling that you continued to communicate with Ms. Schoenecker via email? Um, yes, ma'am. Okay. Was there any particular reason why you all communicated in email fashion when you were still here? I'm, I'm, I'm not a big guy on the phone. I don't really like spending a lot of time on, this, on the phone anyway. Um, email for me was just I could, you know, if I had a thought at uh, 10, 30, or 11 o'clock at night, I could put it down in an email rather than have to make a call and wake somebody up. It just was a, to me, it was an easier way to communicate, and uh, it wasn't going to inconvenience anybody. Was, did that include your wife? Yes, ma'am. I mean, if I have a thought at midnight, I'm sitting up working, and I'm not going to pick up the phone and call at midnight. I'll just send an email. She could get it in the morning and read it. If you were in town and, you know, just going back and forth to work, would you also email her during that time frame? I didn't realize you were asking me about Tampa. I'm sorry. Yeah, some, some uh, I'm time. sorry. Um, sure, I emailed some, sometimes to Julie as well when I was in town. And why would you email to her when you were in town? Um, well, sometimes it was from work, and um, I can't always get a phone line out from work just based on the, the, the work that I do. Um, and uh, again, a lot of the times it was not time sensitive. I might have already been on another system. I went over and typed an email and sent something to her. Make sure you check on this. Make sure Bo's got his, you know, he takes this to the game or, or that sort of stuff. What was your position as far as your rank when you were here in Tampa? I was a colonel, ma'am. And how long were you a colonel at the time that you retired? I was promoted to colonel 1 August 2006. Okay. So almost right at five years, ma'am. Did Ms. Schoenecker, at the time that you all moved here to Tampa, was she socializing with anyone that you were aware of? Ma'am, you know, you move into a town, you don't know a whole lot of folks. I think usually our initial socialization uh, centered around uh, the kids' school or athletic events. So I think the folks we were socializing with the most probably were, were folks from either the cross-country or track team or families from the soccer program. Did she develop a relationship with your realtor that found your home? Um, yes, ma'am. I don't know how she found the, the realtor, but yes, ma'am. Okay. And were they friends outside of being a realtor-client relationship? Once we met each other, yes, ma'am, they became friends. Okay. And what was her name? Lisa Prisco, P-R-I-S-C-O. Were there any other individuals that you were aware of that Ms. Schoenecker would socialize yes, with? Yes, ma'am. There were a couple of three other ladies that she would socialize with in a group, in that group. Okay. And what would they do together if you, that you were aware of? Um, they did some volunteering, I know, at a, a charity golf tournament, I believe sponsored by Outback, but I'm not sure. Um, I believe they did some other volunteer work as well together, and they would meet for lunch a lot. Was Ms. Schoenecker involved with the kids at school, <coughs> like at their schools? No, ma'am, not really that I remember. Okay. Was she involved with their sports at all at any time when they were growing up? Did she coach their teams or do anything of that nature? Yes, ma'am, she coached a baseball team or two here or there when we were in Germany. That were also the children's teams? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We both coached because I coached a soccer. I coached one of both soccer teams as well. Okay. Was there a time in the summer of 2001 that you started to see a decline with your wife, Julie Schenecker? Did you say summer 2001? I'm sorry, 2010, if I did say. 2002. Could you ask a question again, please? Was there a time in the summer of 2010 where you started to see a decline? in your wife's condition? I don't know if it was summer 2010 or not, ma'am. Okay. When you emailed Dr. Obergon eventually in November after the car accident, were those your observations at that time? Yes, ma'am. My observations were captured in that email to doc in the emails to Dr. Obergon. Yes, okay. ma'am. And those are accurate? Those are my perceptions, ma'am. Okay. Were you aware of the situation where um, 
Miss Shunaker was had slapped Calix. Yes, ma'am. Okay. How did you become aware of that situation? Calix told me, I believe, the day of the event. Okay. And did you talk to Miss Shunaker also about it? I did. Okay. Told her it was inappropriate behavior. At some point, did Calix end up going to individual counseling? Yes, ma'am. And what was the reason for that at that time? The intent was to give Calix someone who was a disinterested party to talk to, uh, where she could feel free to um, discuss any issues that she uh, that she may have at that time that she wanted to talk about. That wasn't mom or dad. Were you concerned about the back and forth that was going on at that time between Calix and Ms. Shunaker? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And was that something that you were aware of either by speaking to either one of them or by observing it? Yes, ma'am. Very little was ever said to each other uh, in my presence. Um, Julie would recount what happened, Calix would recount what happened, and then I would find some place in the middle where the truth probably laid. Okay. Did boarding school at some point become an option of, of where Calix may end up going to school? Yes, ma'am. And how did that come to be? So again, kind of along the same lines of the counseling um, thoughts, in, in my mind, uh, there were a couple of things that I wanted to make sure it was happening. First of all, that, uh, that there was a peace, if I could find a way for peace between Calix and, and, uh, and Julie. Uh, I also wanted to allow Calix to have a top-notch education because it really meant a lot to her and meant a lot to us as a family and gave her an opportunity where she might be able to not have the stressors of, of being at home. The IB program that Calix was involved with at King, was that something that was for her a stressful competitive situation academic-wise? King IB is a very competitive uh, program um, and very stressful for all the kids. I was with a lot of the kids uh, the year and a half or so that Calix was at King um, and and talked with a lot of them. It was a, it was a, a highly stressful program. And that would include Calix? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Was there a concern by your wife at the time, Julie Schenecker, that she, that Calix was picking up bad habits at King? Uh, she communicated that to me, yes, ma'am. Okay. And was that also part of the motivation for why she wanted her maybe to go to another school? I can't speak for what Julie's motivation was. Did she talk to you about that? No, ma'am, she didn't communicate that to me. But she talked to you about King being something that she perceived as maybe contributing to Calix behaving differently? Yes, ma'am. Were there other schools considered as far as maybe her not going to King, going to another local school or a private school? Ma'am, I believe uh, we considered Carrollwood Day School, um, but it just wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't going to work. Did Calix go on a tour at that school? I believe she shadowed for a day, yes ma'am. When did you become aware of the accident that Ms. Schenecker was involved in? The car accident? Yes. Uh, I believe the date of that accident was the 8th of November, um, so I would have learned that day. I was called from the scene by a law enforcement officer, police or state trooper, I'm not really sure. When was that in relation to when um, the slapping incident happened? Oh, um, ma'am, I don't remember when the slapping incident happened, I don't know. Do you remember whether it was within days of each other? Oh, ma'am, I don't remember, no. Okay. When the <coughs> investigation was done on, um, on, on the slapping incident to Calix, were you in town during that time when, when the police arrived? At the house, no, ma'am, I was not. It wasn't, a it wasn't a scheduled visit. Where were you at that time when the police arrived to investigate that? I was in Texas. What was, was that for work? No, ma'am. Okay. Was that in November, do you remember? I don't remember, ma'am. Okay. It was in the fall. I know. I remember being in a high school football game while I was there. Okay. And at that time, were you traveling by yourself? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
the car that was involved in the car accident, what kind of vehicle was that? It was a Mercedes E350. <coughs> How did Ms. Schenecker obtain or get that vehicle? She leased that vehicle, ma'am. Okay. The purchase for that vehicle, was that something that you were involved with? Not with that lease, no, ma'am. Okay. Was that unusual for you not to be involved with the purchase or the leasing of a vehicle? Um, it was the first time that she, in our married life, that she had leased a vehicle um, and had purchased one, if you will, on her own. Okay. When I was there otherwise. When was that purchase done? Do you know? Ma'am, I don't remember. Okay. What vehicle did she drive before that? Another, a different Mercedes E350. Okay. And then she leased a newer one, and that was the first time something was purchased without you being aware of it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Prior to that, purchases of vehicles, was that something that you all did together? Um, on the previous Mercedes, the one uh, before the wreck, um, she had scoped it all out and decided what she wanted to do. She asked me to go along that day and to, uh, I guess, to be there for the purchase. Uh, the other purchases of vehicles, either I purchased them or we purchased them together. How long did she have the other Mercedes before she leased the the one that was involved in the car accident? All I can tell you is it's, it was not long, ma'am. I don't. I, I really can't give you an idea how long that was. I just don't remember. Does that mean months or a year, less than a year? It would be less than a year, ma'am. Okay. After the car accident, was Ms. Schenecker taken back to the home or did you take her somewhere else? Um, I took her from the hospital to the house. Okay. And was she allowed to stay in the home at that time? No, ma'am, she was not. Where did you take her? I, I didn't. I took her to the house. Okay. Where did she go after the house? She went to a hotel. And was that a place that you took her, or did she drive herself to the hotel? She went by herself, ma'am. Okay. I arranged it for her, and she went. After the hotel, did she go to Winmore and end up going to treatment there? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And was that something that you were involved with, getting her into the treatment? Yes, ma'am. I took her uh, during her almost her entire intake, which was, I don't know, four or five hours or so. I was there um, for most of that and then had to leave to go pick up carpool. Okay. And I believe that you described in the email that she agreed pretty quickly to go to the rehab. Uh, so coming home from the hospital the day of the wreck, um, I had told her that uh, she was not going to be living in the house, uh, that I just couldn't have her in the house after this. Uh, after that, that incident, it just wouldn't be good for anyone uh, to save her dignity as well as uh, making sure I'm not uh, having, you know, causing problems with the kids. Um, and I said, you're going to, we're going to get you in rehab. And she said, okay. Okay. Prior to the car accident and, and the slapping incident, did you start to observe at some point what you later became aware of as tardive dyskinesia with Ms. Schoenacher. Give me the time frame again, ma'am. I'm asking you, before, when's the first time you observed any tardive dyskinesia? Time frame, ma'am, I really don't know. Okay. Was but it, I was the one that noticed it. Okay, so you were the first one that noticed it. I, so let me, uh, I don't know if anyone else had noticed it, but sitting in front of the computer one evening, um, Julie was in front of a laptop. I happened to look over at her while I was doing something, and uh, I noticed some movement in her jaw. And uh, I said to her, I said, hey, do, you know, do you realize that you're doing this, that you're these, you've got these facial tics? Was and she aware of that? She said, no, I, I didn't. And I said, well, make sure you tell your doc. And she said, okay. Were you involved in writing anything to the doctors or informing them of what you observed? No, ma'am, not at that time. Did you ever at any time write what you observed just regarding the tardive dyskinesia side effects? I don't recall doing that, ma'am. Was that in 2010 or was that earlier? I really don't know, ma'am. Okay. When you observed the 
facial movements. Were there any other physical observations that you made about her movements? No, ma'am. Just that there was some jaw jutting and a little bit of lip smacking, maybe. Did you ever videotape that so that she would be able to see those or she would be able to take that to her doctor? I did, ma'am. Okay. When was that that you did that? Ma'am, I I, it, it would have been at that time I would have taped her and then mentioned to her, hey, did you know you were doing this? And I would have shown her the video. And she said, no, I had no idea. I said, well, make sure you tell your doc. Did the kids notice the symptoms of tardive dyskinesia that she had? I think eventually, yes, ma'am. Did they say anything to you about that? Um, to ask me, you know, why mom's face was contorted or whatever, and I explained to them what I had looked up. Um, I didn't know what it was. At some point, Julie had come back to me and said, they had used the word tardive dyskinesia or the term tardive dyskinesia. So I looked it up my, myself so I could make sure I could explain it to the kids in layman's terms. Were the kid? what was their reaction to that? It was just kind of a strange, you know, it was a strange uh, tick. And so it, it, it took them a little bit by surprise, I'm sure. And so I made sure I explained as best I could to them uh, what to expect. Um, so the reaction might not be as, uh, as kind of, so the reaction would have been a little lesser, less from the kids. When she was exhibiting the symptoms of tardive dyskinesia, was there an effort to try to change those side effects or minimize those side effects with her medication? Ma'am, I'm not really sure. At some point, I believe she mentioned to me that the doc took her off Abilify, but I can't remember how close that was to the time where I had told her, you know, when I showed her their video. Okay. Did you associate that with the Abilify? You know, I, at some point, I guess probably close to when I saw the, the jaw jutting that first time, she must have mentioned to me uh, the term Abilify because I eventually ended up using it in my note to Dr. Obergon to try to give some temporal aspect to, to the story that I was telling. Now, when you say you use the word Abilify, was that something that you are aware of independently through monitoring her treatment or her medication? No, ma'am. She, she would have used that term. She would have said that term to me because otherwise I wouldn't have known it. But I see ads on the, I, I knew the name because there have been ads on the TV for it. After um, Ms. Schenecker was involved with the car accident, was there a decision by you or collectively about driving the children at that point? Yes, ma'am. And what conclusion did you reach at that point? So I, I told her she was not driving the kids um, anymore, and uh, she was certainly not going to be driving the kids if she was drinking. Okay. And we were going to get that taken care of with her going to rehab at Winmore. Now, when she went to rehab and she ended up coming out of rehab, was there any effort at that point to eliminate alcohol from your home? No, ma'am, there was not. I didn't, had not had that experience with my father, who was a recovering alcoholic, and I, I didn't think about doing it. Okay. When she went to rehab, your mother, did she end up coming during that time frame? Yes, ma'am. Eventually, I found out that on the day of the accident, Julie apparently called my mom and asked her to come and help. Uh, didn't I didn't know that until actually after the kids died, and, and my mom and I were talking about it one day. But yes, my mom did come. Okay. So your mom came to help out with the kids at, at, at Miss Schenecker, at Julie Schenecker's request? That's my understanding, yes, ma'am. Okay. Your mom and um, Julie Schenecker, did they get along? Yes, ma'am, as far as I could tell. Okay. And were they both helpful with the children? Were there any jealousy issues with the children and your mother? Ma'am, not communicated to me. Okay. Anything that you observed? No, ma'am. Okay. At some point after your wife, Julie Schenecker, exits rehab. Do you end up picking her up? Yes, ma'am, the 28th of November, 2010. And is that the Sunday after Thanksgiving? It's the Sunday after Thanksgiving, yes, ma'am. That Thanksgiving weekend, were you out of town with your mother and the children and meeting your brother? Yes, ma'am, we spent Thanksgiving vacation out of town. Okay. 
And when you returned to town, you picked up your wife at the time and brought her home? Yes, ma'am. When you brought Ms. Schenecker home, was there a discussion that you had with her about not apologizing to the children and the children seeing action from her? Yes, ma'am. We stopped at lunch on the way home, and I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to talk about things before we got back into the house. And I had communicated to her that time that the most important thing for her to do was to show the kids through her actions that she was changing her behavior, not to just come home and just apologize and just make it a battle of words, but she needed to show through her actions that she was changing her behavior. And did she follow suit with what you told her and didn't apologize to the children? I don't know, ma'am. Were you present for when she came home? I wasn't present for an apology, Okay. but I don't know if she had eventually talked to the kids or not. I don't know. But in your presence when she came home from rehab, did she ever have that, that discussion? No, ma'am. Were the kids aware at that time when your wife came home from rehab that she had had an accident? Yes, ma'am. Were they aware in any fashion that it may have involved alcohol? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Schenecker came home from rehab, did she function and assimilate back into the family at that point? N not like we were expecting, no ma'am. What did she do at that point? Uh, ma'am, she, she pretty much just kind of holed up in the bedroom for most of the day. Now the bedroom that she's in, are you all sharing that bedroom at this time? Oh yes ma'am. When you come back and, and she's back from rehab in December after Thanksgiving break is over. Are you going back to work? At some point, yes ma'am, I was back to work uh, kind of full time if you will. I had informed my supervisor that uh, Julie was in rehab and I was gonna need a more flexible schedule and okay. he understood. Okay, a flexible schedule meaning you're gonna be involved with the pickup of the children since she wasn't driving the children. So I might have to leave at any moment's notice if someone is, is not taking care of what they need to take care of. Okay. If I needed to go over to uh, rehab or stuff like that, I, I needed to, he needed to know that I might need to drop things and just roll out. Are you communicating with your wife at this time when she gets out of rehab and she stays in bed? Mostly through email um, because I was up in the morning before she was up. I was up, it was dark and I was commuting into work. And uh, in the evenings, I would get back and, uh, you know, it was really got home, made sure the kids were okay, taking care of trying to get dinner on the table. My mom and I were doing that together um, and just take care of all the stuff that, that might not be getting done during the day. As so I, I may not have had the opportunity to just sit and have a conversation with Julie. She might have been asleep. I wasn't going to wake her up. So. Okay. So you're not verbally communicating, but you're communicating via email during this time frame. Uh, there were some verbal communications, but I, I didn't sit and have long conversations with her, no ma'am. Okay. Were you aware of whether she was doing ongoing treatment, either going to the doctor, AA, anything like that? Communicated to me that she was still going, we did have a discussion about still going to her doctor's appointments. Uh, we did have discussions about going to AA, and what was com communicated to me was she was still going to see her docs, and that she was, she was going to meetings, okay. or intended to go to meetings. Did you require from her any verification about whether she was attending AA? No, ma'am. Were you under the thought process at that point that she was not going to resume driving the children until she was going to AA or, or doing things of that nature? Um, so my view was when she came out of rehab and she had told me she was not drinking, I asked her the question, I was not noticing that there were bottles that were going in and out of the trash and I didn't go digging through the trash. Just, I'm not gonna do that. Um, she had told me she wasn't drinking. I didn't see that she was drinking most of the day. She was, that I, well, but I don't know what she was doing during the day, but when I would come home in the evening, a lot of times she was, she was in the bedroom. 
Um, at that time, immediately after rehab, uh, so my mother was in town, so she was she was running carpool uh, as well as I was running carpool. So at that time, there were no uh, responsibilities necessarily for Julie to have to drive carpool or you know drive the kids where I had told her before she wasn't. At what point did your mom end up leaving? Uh, my mother left early sometime in maybe mid-December um, at the maybe the day or two after when I asked Julie um, I said you know hey you, you really need to get back in and show the kids through your actions you need to reassimilate in the family and get back involved and she said I'll get out of bed when your mom leaves and when she told you that what did you do I uh, I told her I, that I didn't think that that was uh, that made any sense Certainly the kids were not going to understand that. Um, it didn't make any sense to me. And um, you know, my thought was she was choosing to be in bed. So I told my mom, I said, hey, Julie says she's not getting out of bed until, until you leave. And my mom said, well, okay, I'll go. Okay. And I want to say with maybe within a couple of days, she scheduled her, her plane trip back to Louisiana at that time. Do you remember when her original flight was scheduled? No, ma'am. Okay. I do not think she was scheduled to be with us for Christmas but I, I can't say for sure. Did she leave before the Christmas break for the children? I, um, I don't know when the kids got out for Christmas that year. My recollection is maybe around 12 December or so, my mom may have departed and that would have been before the Christmas break. Okay. <clears throat> But I, I don't know for sure. That's a long time ago. After your mother leaves, does Julie's condition improve? Does she start functioning? She does, ma'am. Um, she uh, she ends up having to drive carpool uh, because you know my mom's not there every day, and I couldn't get carpool every day. So she starts she resumes carpool uh, because she had told me she was not drinking. I was not noticing any bottles coming and going out of the house um, and uh, the other responsibility she had was uh, was to have dinner um, every evening um, that's not something that really had been a requirement in the past but it was a forcing function for me to ensure that she was up and out and participating back in the family doing those sort of things that we had asked her to do in family council okay so with your mother leaving that was forcing her to engage back in the family uh, well my mother left yeah that was a forcing function for her to, to engage again right okay. at some point you indicate to dr obergon some comments about suicide from your wife at the time yes ma'am when did she talk to you about that um specifically with dr dr obergon because we've talked julie and i talked about suicide many times over the years okay when did she talk to you in those times after rehab? It was some time after rehab, ma'am. I don't remember the timing. Okay. Do you remember, I would assume, it's sometime after rehab to the time that the email is sent on the 31st of December? Um, was that included in that email on yes. the 31st? Yes, ma'am. It would have been that time. Okay. And you mentioned that Julie's mentioning suicide and you're hoping that she doesn't have enough energy to commit suicide. I believe what I said was she had mentioned suicide, but not that she was planning on acting on it. And that my hope was that her energy was too low to. Now at that time on December 31st, you were going out of town? Yes, ma'am. And what was the trip that you had planned for the 31st? So Bo and I went to the Rose Bowl. Okay. When did you, what was the time frame of your travel then? We left the 31st uh, and flew through Texas, uh, got into California on the 1st, uh, went to the game, stayed the night, and then came back on the 2nd. Prior to that travel that you did on the 31st, was there some other travel that you did back and forth to California? Yes, ma'am. Tell me about that. Uh, so, ma'am, there was a, a weekend uh, where I traveled to, uh, to California twice. Um, I was at a cusp of uh, achieving a level on uh, frequent flyer miles. 
um, that um, going twice to California in a weekend could allow me to attain. And the intent behind that was to get to a level to make my international travel easier, because those are really long trips for me, as well as get an opportunity. For instance, I used those miles to take Julie to Hawaii when I came back from my, you know, my uh, deployment to Afghanistan. But the intent was to make my international travel, which was extensive, easier for me. To keep the executive class for as far as your mileage? To attain it, yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you did those back and forth trips to California, um, when was that? What so, month was that? I don't remember the timing. I mean, I did it one time. I left on Friday, flew out, took the red eye back, got back in Saturday morning, left the airport, went to Bo's soccer game, went back to the airport, and then did the same thing. Is that in that November, December time frame? I don't remember, ma'am. After the, um, when you took Bo to the Rose Bowl, when you were out of town on the 31st, at that point, you indicate you're you're out of town at Cal in California with Bo and Calix is staying with a friend. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So your indication to Dr. Obergon at that time is that Julie is home by herself. Yes, ma'am. I actually stated that in the email. I okay. wanted him to know he was her treating physician. Now, when you wanted him to know, what was the purpose of giving him the information that you're relaying to him at that time? So that was a fairly lengthy email, if I remember correctly. Um, so at that time, my thought process was the problem at hand was a chemical and substance abuse problem. It was alcohol, and then I found out while she was in rehab that it was drugs as well. Uh, that was the problem that I was so trying to solve with rehab. I passed as much of the information that I had and my perceptions and observations to Dr. Obergon because he needed to know. Um, kind of what was going on. In my mind, I thought he needed to know what was going on. Um, and f as we've heard in testimony the last couple of days, folks tend to underreport. So I wanted to make sure that Dr. Obergon knew, it had the benefit of my observations as to what had been happening and maybe a little bit more of the backstory to make sure that she was getting the treatment that she needed. Did you ever refer to that as guilty knowledge? refer to what is guilty knowledge the information that you were relaying to dr. Obergon I don't ever remember saying that ma'am did you ever say guilty knowledge to dr. Otto about that information uh, I might have that's a term that I that I use often at work yes ma'am so it's possible I could have said that to dr. Otto that you wanted dr. Obergon to have guilty knowledge it's possible When you came back from the Rose Bowl, that would have been January 1st or 2nd? It would have been the 2nd, ma'am. Were there any other trips that you made between January 2nd and the time that you ended up being deployed? I don't remember, ma'am. There could, there could be something, but I, I don't remember. Okay. And at that point, are you engaged in picking up the slack from Julie Schenecker, or is she involved with her duties at that time? She is executing carpool, car, excuse me, carpool and uh, and dinner as well. Now, at some point, you indicate to Dr. Obergon that Bo has this conversation with you about. Julie's driving or wanting not wanting to be in the car with her. Yes, ma'am. Was there any time reference for when that happened where there was driving that he was concerned about? No, ma'am. I can't remember whether Bo had that conversation with me after or before Julie was in rehab. I believe it was before, but I, I, I don't know for sure. At some point at the end of December, do you end up going to some family counseling, family therapy? together just you and your wife and then also you your wife and your children yeah, i don't remember the timing but yes ma'am we did okay and that would have been after she got out of rehab i think so we, we would have if we we at least were continuing it after she got out of rehab i don't know if it started before or not i don't remember was there any uh, any consideration by you during this time frame 
to divorce Julie Schoeninger? No, ma'am. Okay. Were you committed to your family and, and trying to make things better? Yes, ma'am, for 20 years. Did you ever express to Julie Schoeninger during that time frame that you were going to divorce her? No, ma'am. The email that Ms. Schoeninger was worried about being a potential divorce email, who was that email sent to? Is that the 15 January email, ma'am? Yes. Okay. That email was sent to Jim Powers, Pat Powers, Dave Powers, Carol Powers, Nancy Schenecker and Edmund Schenecker. What prompted that email? Um, you know, I thought it was, uh, it was, it was an opportunity for, well, what prompted, I'm sorry, I'll, ask, I'll answer your question. Um, I had received a couple of communications from Julie's family members, uh, concerned about the way that I was handling the situation between Calix and Julie. And, um, I felt it was an opportunity to kind of lay bare uh, things that had been happening to give everybody an opportunity to help. Okay. And at that time when you communicated the information, um, you expressed dealing with her illness for 20 plus years in your marriage? Yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. And you talk, did you talk about her um, being sick before you met, met her? That was my assessment, yes, ma'am. Okay. How did you describe her judgment in the email? Um, I had said that uh, I think I asked, have any of you, ha have any of you ever lived with a 50 year old who has the judgment of a 10 year old? Okay. Specifically talking about her engagements with Calix, as I had mentioned before, where she would not disengage. And when you were talking about that, that's not the first time you mentioned her judgment being <clears throat> immature. I don't ever remember saying that to anybody before. You didn't mention that to Dr. Obergon in your email as well? I thought you meant family. Okay. I thought you meant family. I, I, I did, I'm sure, with the email to Dr. Obergon. And you mentioned to Dr. Obergon that your perception at that time is that she's low functioning. That was my perception, yes, ma'am. Step up, so. And John, I'll remind you uh, not to discuss this case uh, among yourselves, not to discuss it with anyone else, not to allow anyone to discuss it with you in your presence, not to speak at all with the attorneys, witnesses, defendant about any subject to your deliberations are finished, not to read nor listen to any reports about the case from any source, not to do any sort of research, gather information, or communicate about the case or the people or places involved through any means, including electronic devices. We'll give you a morning break. All right.